Yes, sir. Securing position. Yes, sir. High speed, low drag. Sir, yes, sir. Move it out. Destination commander. Construction position. New construction options. Building. Didn't see you there. Oh. Sorry about that. You can call me Aiden, or if you prefer, Burger Bob. It's nice to meet you. Anyway, today we're here to talk about valves. Valves of all different kinds. Well, just kidding. I have a, I have a bit of a smaller scope for this video. Um, it might be the longest one I've ever made. It might be the most involved one I've ever made. Um, but today we're going to talk about rotors and a couple different ones. We're going to talk about Thayer's, only one kind because that's all I have. And Hagman's, only one kind because there's only one kind of Hagman. I'm not offering this to be the end-all be-all guide on all valves on trombone because that would be ridiculous and it would be like a documentary that's 12 hours long. Um, and there's a huge amount of valves, like I said, not represented in this video. Um, all the variations on the rotor valve, like green hose, Shire's rotor, all sorts of things, I just don't have those right now. I actually will have a green hose base at some point um, to show you guys. That is not mine, but we'll go over that in a future video. I don't have any variations on the Thayer, I don't have any like Shire's axials or Edwards axials or anything. I only have mine. And I don't have any dead valves in this video like the K or Miller valve or the Holton Monster, any of those kind of things. I just don't have them with me. This is meant to be kind of just a basic overview of the three main-ish types of valve. Um, so even valves from the same families can play very differently. Like I said, a basic rotor on a Bach 42 and a green hoe valve on a Bach 42 are going to play completely differently, even though the basic design of those valves is, you know, on the surface level, pretty much the same. The same thing goes for axials. There's many different kinds of axials and they all play very differently. <clears throat> and my main point that I'm going to make at the end of this video again is that a good valve that is well maintained and in good shape is always going to play better than a fancy valve that has a leak. And that's just, just, it's just how it is. And of course, a valve is only one little tiny part of an instrument. It might be a larger part of an instrument if it's a bass, but it's still only one factor in an instrument. And if you're playing a really crappy instrument with good valves, it's not going to make it a good horn. And if you play a really good instrument with bad valves, the same thing is going to happen. It needs to be considered as a part of an entire trombone organism. So, without further ado, let's go on to rotors. And we're back. We're talking about rotors. I have my sample 42BG right here. Um, this is just going to be our sample today because I think I need to oil it. And hey, why not get something done while I make this video? So, a little history on the rotor valve. Um, the rotor valve was invented in 1832 um, as a new kind of um, instrument valve. Valves had only been around for maybe 20-ish years with the Stotzel valve being the very first piston type valve but not really a valve we see today. Um, and this was kind of a logical progression in a different direction than the Stotzel valve. This actually came before the piston valve that we all know that's on every other valve instrument that we can think of. Um, the rotary valve was first. So um, this was not the first valve placed on brass instruments, but it's basically the first one that is still used today. Um, Vienna valves, I think, may have been, I think there goes, those are called pumpern or something. Those were around just a little bit before, and those are still used on Vienna horns, but that's a pretty small subset of valve use today. Um, and they're still widely used, obviously. The rotor has just been around forever. It's on so many instruments now. I mean, you can still buy exactly this instrument right now if you wanted to. Um, and the rotor has been improved in a lot of ways. And we'll, well, I guess we'll get a good look at the inside of this, and I can show you guys a little bit about how they've been improved. So let's delve into the instrument. Cool, so we're going to take this thing apart. Um, tools that we're going to need for a rotor valve are pretty simple. Screwdriver and a big old hammer. I use a rubber mallet. Most people use a rawhide mallet. Um, I'm not fancy enough to own one of those, so I just have this rubber mallet. These are like $4 or something. 
So first we start by taking this off. Just in case you guys can't see, there's a screw right here. We gotta get this guy out. And yeah, really just have to start it with a screwdriver. I've done videos on how to take your valves apart and clean them and stuff before, so I'm not gonna go super in depth. Just make sure you don't lose a screw. Uh, let's get off the stop arm. There we go. I usually have to use a screwdriver for leverage. You probably shouldn't do this, but I do. Get that off nice and safely. You don't want that bump around. This is where the spring is on a box, so if you let it go, it'll smack into your back plate. Cool. Flip that guy over. Um, the annoying thing about box is that a lot of times the lever will get in the way of this, but on this, it's actually almost out of the way. I'm not sure why. So we unscrew this, keeping the lever out of the way. Now the lever is out of the way, which is pretty rare, I would say. So here's one of the main parts of a rotor valve is this end cap. This basically just seals in the back of the valve. Um, you don't have to worry about it. Obviously, this is the part that goes against your neck. If you don't have this, then you just have oil against your neck and a moving part, actually. So let's do this. This is the hardest part, probably. Let's do this off of the table. Um, I'm going to whack this guy nice and gently a couple times to get the back plate off. And I'll show you what that is in a second. There we go. Nice and easy. You want to catch this stuff as it comes out. There we go. So, parts of a rotor valve. Pretty simple if you really think about it. We have the back plate right here. This is what the cap was over. Put that right here. And then we have the rotor valve itself. Very simple mechanism. It's symmetrical. Um, it doesn't matter which way you put this in um, unless the the end that the stop arm goes over, that's the part the lever is attached to. Unless this is keyed a certain direction, this doesn't matter which direction you put it in. And box, at least this one is not keyed, so you can put it um, 90 or 180 degrees different if you want. So basically, let's check this out. Let's put the valve back in. Um, this is very simple, right? The air comes in here. And then if the valve is rotated like this, and of course you can't really see that because it's all inside, but if the valve is rotated like this, the channel is at the bottom, so the air goes through here, and then it just keeps going. The valve is, is open right now, it's not being used. And then if you rotate that 90 degrees so that the channels are like this, then the air hits this channel up, and now it has to go up this way, go through the valve tubing, come back, and then this other channel is now facing this way, and it goes this way. It's a very simple thing. These, um, the rotor valve is also used in a lot of like engineering applications, all sorts of other stuff. Um, it's probably used in some way, like in your faucet at home. Um, and it's just been around for a long time. It's a very simple thing. Um, the problem, I guess, that you get with a lot of rotor valves is that these channels here, where that um, air goes through, you may notice that if you block this off, and you can see it right here, and I'll put it in the light, if you block this off, it's not a circle. The valve path or the air path has been made smaller. And that's just something that has to be done because you have to make a much larger rotary valve to make that all fit. And for some reason that was just not a thing for a very long time, to make a rotor valve that would make the path not smaller in any direction. Um, I'm not really sure why that is. Some other instruments like the uh, I think there's some tubas and stuff will have valves that are larger to the side, so the path will be oval, but it'll still be the same size um, volumetrically. Um, and, you know, modern valves are much larger. They fit the entire path through the instrument, or through the valve. Um, but Bach did not do this for a very long time. Um, and this actually is a good example of this valve is the same exact valve that is on the Bach 36, which is a medium bore. 525 instrument. This is a 547. And they put the exact same valve on this instrument. Why they did that? Because it saved a lot of money to make the same valve for two instruments that sold very well. They didn't have to change anything. All this is exactly the same on the 36 and the 42. They just put a larger bell on the end. <clears throat> this is a lot of money to do that. Um, and it ended up that uh, changing the valve out much later on made for a large improvement on the 42. Let's talk about bearings. Bearings are where the valve necessarily touches the casing. And on a rotor valve, bearings are in many places. So bearing is right here at the end. This 
touches the en edge of the casing. This is the inside, like the part that's touching this. This touches the casing as well as maybe a little bit of the, uh, the this guy, whatever this is called, spindle, there we go. Um, the bottom of the valve right here around the edge. Um, you notice how there's a hollow spot right here. That's so all of that is not a bearing. There's not so much surface area touching the edge. All of the outside of the valve right here, this is all stuff that needs to touch the outside of the casing or it doesn't seal. And then again, the back, the bearing on the back and the small spindle sticking out of the back, all of this touches all the casing. So on a rotor valve, there's necessarily a lot of bearing surface. A lot of stuff that needs oil to seal and work well. These are all things you need to oil when you put your valves back together to make sure that they work very well. There we go, put some oil there. Um, I put oil on this, I put oil around the edge. So there we go, that's the, the rotor valve. Let's put it back together, just so we can get a, a good idea for how it works. Um, the valve is inside, and it doesn't really matter which way this is turning right now. Um, we put the cap on, and line this up, there's a witness mark, that's what this is called right here. There's a little like kind of gash in the side that matches up with the casing. I'm gonna put that in the right spot. And then you press this down evenly on all sides. And if I did this right, yep, I did. The valve will turn nice and easily. We'll put on the valve cap. Flip this back over. Put on the stop arm. Sometimes you'll need to kind of whack on the stop arm again or use the screw to get it on the rest of the way. And then we'll screw on the screw. And that's how rotor valve works. It's a very simple design. It's actually a pretty good design um, because it's kind of simple. It's easy to make, all sorts of that stuff. We'll talk about that in a second. That's the rotor valve. So now that we've seen how a rotor works, let's talk about the rotor in practice. So. We'll start off with some pros, pros and cons, but we'll start with the pros of the rotor valve in use on trombones. We got lots of pros for the rotor valve. For one, it's really easy to make. There's not a lot of really involved machining or processes to make a rotor valve. You have a casing made out of brass, it's pretty easy to machine, like kind of put together. Then you have a rotor core that's usually made out of brass, maybe it's plated in nickel or something to make a different material for the inside. Um, also pretty easy to machine, just a lot of kind of lathe work and then maybe some drilling. The rotor is pretty easy to make, as evidenced by the fact that they made them for lots and lots and lots of years before we had good machining. Um, rotors built before a certain point were usually built instead of machined the way we do now, um, like I talked about, or I will talk about in the Hagman video, um, or Hagman portion of this video, but rotors today are usually machined. Um, Canstool CR valves, I think, are built. They're kind of like Hagman's in that way. Um, but most rotors are usually machined, and they're pretty easy to make. Uh, they're easy to work with. Um, like when you're putting them on an instrument, they're kind of not hard to deal with. Um, you know, they're just easy to maintain. They're easy to take apart. Um, there's nothing in the instrument that has to like come apart for them to be worked on. Um, you just take off the valve cap, you get the valve out. Um, the only Downside of that, of course, is just the back plate um, being kind of hard to get off sometimes if you're an amateur like myself. Um, so they're easy to work with maintenance-wise. They're easy to make. Um, durability, they're pretty durable. I mean, there's no valve or brass instrument part that's like actually, I would say, durable. That's going to take a lot of beating. I've seen a lot of valves on marching band instruments. This isn't one, of course, but that have been crunched um, and destroyed because of this weakness right here, um, when you do horn moves with an instrument, um, this little valve knuckle, that's what the little things coming out of the valve are called, this is kind of a weak point and it'll crunch into the valve casing and not allow the valve to move anymore. So that's a weak point with the, the rotor, but not a strong point really with any valve. So I'm not sure if we can really call that a con since, well, you can call this a con because it is con. <laughs> But all instruments have that kind of weak point, so there's not really a way around that. Um, they're easy to play in a certain way. Um, obviously, the Bach rotor, it's not hard to play, but if you want to play things really loudly or with a giant sound, 
it's not easy to play. There's kind of different ways to look at it. And of course, we're talking about so many different kinds of rotor when I say rotor. Um, green hose, for instance, are not hard to play. They're very good valves. Shires uh, rotors are very easy to play. Um, there's a huge scale of rotors from tiny little things like that are put on old S-series bass trombones all the way to um, we'll say the Kahn Lindbergh rotor, which is much, much larger and much easier to play. Um, there's kind of just a giant thing in the middle there. You know, I mean, there's lots of range that the instrument can be. And price. Uh, rotors are pretty cheap. Since they're easy to make, at least rotors like this, since they're easy to make, they're cheap to sell. They're cheap to make. Um, and let's get on to the cons. So, cons. Price. Some rotors are not easy to make. Some rotors are very difficult and machined or you know, they're hand built or whatever. Like green hose, M&W valves, Shires valves are very, very expensive. Um, and there's kind of no way around that. There's some that are very cheap like these. Um, like you can buy blessing valves for like 100 bucks a pop or something. They're very cheap. Or you can buy um, Rotax valves which are like $1,500 for two valves by themselves. I mean there's just kind of there's a huge range again because we're talking about rotors which covers a lot of things. Another con is they're typically smaller bore through the valve than the rest of that area of the trombone. So the trombone bore size um, you know, through the slide is usually different than it is here because it's slowly getting larger. And this area should be a little bit larger than the bore size. And that's not always the case with rotors. Um, the thing is that can still make for a good design. Like I'm pretty sure the con rotor is not full bore size, you know, larger through the valve than it, sh um, than it should be, maybe. But it still plays really well, and I wouldn't call it a bad rotor valve by any means. Um, and of course, that's changed on a lot of modern rotors, which are larger than the older ones. Um, they're harder to play for some people, um, including myself to an extent, especially in the low range, just because they will not take the same kind of air. Um, that like a Thayer or a Hagen will to play in that range. Um, there's a thing called rotor pop. If you ever play like B flat and C in the staff and you go da 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 da, um, you might hear a <laughs> uh, between the notes. And that's caused by the rotor cutting off the air and then letting it through again, kind of creating a back pressure and then an open spot and then a back pressure and then an open spot. Um, and that creates a little pop. I really get that on green hose actually, more than I do on these, um, probably because these rotors don't have quite as much seal as a modern valve does, and they kind of let some of the air through in between the note change. Um, what was I going to say? I had something about modern valves, whatever, we'll get to that. So here's some examples of different kinds of valves, in no particular order, um, and this is kind of the range we're talking about when we talk about rotor valves. We've got Olds, Kahn, Holton, King, Bach, Miles Schmidt, Leitch, Greenho, MW, Olsen, Shires, CR, Rotax. Um, there's the, the valves that uh, Getson puts on their instruments and Edwards, which I'm not sure are exactly the same. There's different sizes of all these uh, valves. I mean, there's just a huge variety of rotors. Um, and we're talking about just these, these kind of looking rotors. Of course, I talked about all valves are rotors. These or in particular what I'm talking about. There's just so many different kinds that it's kind of hard to lump them all in one category. And hopefully when I get this green hoe bass trombone I can talk a little bit more about those. So something that is specific more to rotor valves than any other kind of valve is the valve wrap. How is the F attachment or D attachment or whatever the second valve is tubing situated on the instrument. Is it closed? Is it open? What kind of open is it? What kind of close is it? There's so many different things to talk about here. Let's start off with why the open wrap was developed. Because we started off with the closed wrap, which looks kind of like this. I have a better example that's not on my desk because I'm an idiot. Um, the open wrap was developed probably in like the mid 60s, 70s, something like that, um, by a few different people. and. Here's some reasons why that would have happened. To eliminate spit, one of the um, downsides of the closed wrap is that we have this little, um, this little guy right here, this little crook, this little bend. There we go. I can't think of names of things today. Um, when you have this and you play the horn, it's either sitting like this or like this. 
spit collects right here, spit or condensation, whatever you want to call it. Um, and eventually you have to take out the valve slide, dump it out, put it back in. For me, that's not a huge downside. Um, I don't mind doing that. But when you have an open wrap like you see on a 42BO or something like that, all the spit runs down towards the valve and eventually comes out of the valve. You don't have to worry about it. So that's a kind of a, a big reason for a lot of people why the open wrap was invented, just to eliminate that, to open up the blow. So um, especially on Bach instruments, the closed wrap was seen as the reason why the low range was not quite as open <clears throat> on multiple valve horns like the 50B2 and the 50B3. Um, both of which have closed wraps. So some people started opening up the wraps to see if that would make the low range easier to play. In my opinion, doesn't make that big of a difference on these instruments in those settings just because the valve is actually the problem. And of course most of this was done as aftermarket on horns that already had closed wraps and straight horns that had no wrap at all and someone put on a valve and the person doing it, maybe it was Larry Minnick, maybe it was some other technician of the era, of the era just put on a, uh, an open wrap because it's easier to make. So marketing has really taken over the reason, um, it's kind of obscured the reason that we do open wraps. Now it's all about, it makes for an open blow and blah, blah, blah. Most high school students will say, oh yes, obviously the open wrap is better than a closed wrap. I even thought so myself when I was younger. Um, but that's not always the case. The main things that change when you change a wrap are the bracing. And I wish I had an example here for you, but the 42B and the 42BO have a different wrap, obviously, but they also have completely different bracing. That's the little guys that go between like the bell and the different wraps and all that kind of stuff. Those are the little parts that connect all that stuff together. And for instance, on the 42B, there's only the bell brace here, or the tuning slide brace, and a bell brace here. Then on the 42BO, there's tuning slide brace, another brace here between these two parts, and another brace, or the same brace right here. So there's an extra brace entirely that is not on the 42B. That probably changes a lot just in itself, much less all the different braces that are in different places and the weight distribution change that happens all over the place. That probably changes a lot more than just the small difference that you get in having more straight tubing than not. Um, at least in my opinion and in several um, technicians' opinions. The thing about um, open wraps is that they're just a lot easier to make than a closed wrap. You have like maybe a bend this way and then a lot of straight tubing and then a crook at the end and then a lot of straight tubing and then a little bend back into the valve. And for most manufacturers, that's just easier to make. So now, I think, with the advent of really good valves, it's not so much that the open wrap makes a difference when you have like a green hoe valve, it's that it's just easier for a green hoe to make an open wrap than anything else. And that's probably the biggest difference. Um, some things you lose with an open wrap is um, the pull to E, like on bass trombones, this, is E, and on some open wrap instruments, you actually can't get out that far because you don't have enough um, movable tubing to get out to E. Um, my 50T, I could barely get to E, but I didn't have a lot of wiggle room at the end. And this has a fair amount left. And when you have that wiggle room, that means more of the tubing is sealing against the outer tubing, and it plays better. If you're out at the very end of the tubing and it's about to fall out, it's not gonna seal very well and it's probably not gonna play very well. So that's kind of a small point if you're playing a single bass or a tenor that you need to play low C on. It's better to have more tubing left when you're pulled out to E, in my opinion. And there we go. That's, that's a little oversight about wraps. Um, I'm lucky enough to have this instrument that has a closed wrap and then on the back an open wrap. This was made by Minnick to open up the crook at the end of this instead of being this smaller um, size right here. We've got a much larger crook on the end. I'm not sure if this makes any difference. The problem is I have, I've had another 50B2 with a standard D slide, which had the small crook, but that D slide also had a hole in the end of it, so I can't really tell you um, how much of a difference that made. And as usual, and I'm, I'm going to talk about this at the end of the entire video, 
the whole instrument needs to be considered, not just the rack or the valve or the bell type or the slide. The whole instrument as a whole organism has to be considered. And there's lots of very good instruments that have a closed wrap. So I've been talking about rotors for a long time now, and I guess there's a lot to talk about. I want to follow up at the very end um, of the rotor segment with my opinions about rotors. And I have lots of them, lots of stuff in my little script right here. First things first, a good rotor is kind of hard to beat, like something like the Shires base with rotors, for instance, or the rotor on the 60H, or a rotor on maybe a Bach 50B. Um, those are just kind of hard to beat. They just the whole instrument has been designed around that, and that instrument as an organism plays very well. There's nothing wrong with that. And of course, these rotors have to be in good shape. They have to be still sealing. They have to be oiled. Um, they have to have good linkage that doesn't just suck to play. Um, that's really hard to beat. The problem is a bad rotor is really easy to beat. For instance, the rotor in my current 42BG has been messed with. Someone opened up the rotor ports. It doesn't seal very well. The, the tubing is all wonky and stuff. And just the low range on that instrument is really bad. So that's an instrument I can't really defend the rotor on just because it's not very good. And there's lots of instruments like that. The other 40 or uh, 50 B2s I've had in the past did not have very good rotors. And I that's probably one of the main reasons those were not very good instruments that I sold and moved on from. This actually has very good rotors, and I'm kind of happy with how it plays right now. It's not perfect, it's not as open as my 50T3, but the way it is right now, is, I think, is a very good instrument. Uh, like I said, instruments designed around a good rotor are typically good instruments. Go figure. Um, the Con 88H, just in its standard form with a closed wrap, is a great instrument with a good low range and just overall a good design. There's not a lot you can do to improve it. People have improved it, I think. The 88HO with the uh, open wrap is, is good. Um, the 88HCL, the Christian Limber valve, is pretty good too, but I personally just like the 88H just as is. I don't think you really need to make a change to it. Um, and the problem really comes when you get to double valve bass trombones, like this, but more the 50B3 other um, double inline rotor bass trombones are not as good as they can be with better valves, I think. And that's when you kind of run into the limits of the stock rotor valve. Um, instruments like Shires Bass Drones, Green Hose, M&Ws, etc. with double inline rotors are all really good because they have really good rotor valves. The rotor does require a slightly different way of playing. You have to change just a little bit about what you do when you use two, maybe even one valve. Um, with a rotor. Um, and I'll talk about this in the Thayer video, but it's a lot easier to just not change anything with a Thayer and just do what you do all the time. And that's something that you do have to be aware of with rotors. You have to change your air just a little bit, maybe use you know, a slightly different oral shape, something like that, to just kind of work around the rotor. Um, what was I going to say? Uh, oh, I do prefer closed wraps just due to size. Some open wraps, like the uh, Bach open wraps, the 42BO and the 50BO, are just stupidly long. There's no reason for them to stick out like 8 inches behind the tuning slide. I, that really annoys me, and so I prefer closed wraps just because they're small and they fit in smaller spaces. Uh, and of course, like I'm maybe ragging on rotors a little bit, but I'm having a rotor put on my 42 B, my other 42B, which is off, getting worked on right now, uh, that's having an Olsen ball bearing rotor put on it, um, and it's going to be awesome. I'm super excited for that. And as always, I think rotors are probably one of the better choices, modern rotors that you can get aftermarket, are one of the better choices for an instrument just because they're so much cheaper than a lot of the other choices we have. So there we go. That's everything about rotors for today. Um, I'm going to play a little bit of an excerpt on this so you can hear what a rotor instrument sounds like.
So here we are with our axial valve. We're going to go over a little bit of the history. The axial valve was developed by Orla Ed Thayer over the, spo uh, over the space, the space, there we go, I can talk, uh, of about 30 years. It took a long time. It started in the 40s when he was playing horn, and his teacher was like, I feel like if we had more open valves that were just kind of easier to play through, we could sound more like a trombone on the French horn. And, I mean, maybe that's true. So, Orla decided to kind of go with this axial flow concept and try and make this new valve for the French horn that would just be kind of easier to play through. And he kept up with this for 30 years, and then he hooked up with Con Selmer, who um, wanted him to make prototypes not for French horn, because no one really seemed to complain about horn valves, but for trombones. So they, act, um, they told him to make a prototype for the 42, I think, and he did in the late 70s, like 1978. He made a prototype for the 42B, and it never made it in production. That was a very, very early version of the Thayer. Um, and he kind of had like a falling out with uh, Selmer and eventually started his own company and ta-da, we ended up with Thayer valves. Um, he went through a lot of iterations of the Thayer. This cone shape that we're all familiar with for the axial valve um, kind of came along much later in the cycle in about the 80s, mid 80s, something like that. And that's where we get the axial cone shape we're so familiar with. So. We call these axials now. These are Thayer valves. He's the guy who invented them. He is Thayer. Now we call them axials because multiple companies um, have the rights, or maybe there are no rights. I don't know if the patent expired or something. Um, now multiple companies make them, and they don't want to call them Thayers because they're not making Thayer valves. They're just making their own um, version of this. They call them axial, um, axial flow valves. So now we call them axial flow valves, which kind of annoys me because Thayer is the guy who started the whole thing. Um, they are Thayer valves. Now look at me. I have OE Thayer valves right here um, for you guys to check out. Um, this is my G-flat valve on my base, and we're going to take it apart see how it works and learn why it's called axial flow. Why do we call it that? So luckily I already used all the tools I need, which is only this. I only need a screwdriver. That's in my um, Thayer disassembly video. We don't need to go into that right now. You start with the lock ring, take this apart, and then this one is a slip joint, so I take it apart right here. Nice and easy, some water falls out. We'll talk about the bearings here in a second and why water just fell out. So, um, we've been calling rotors, the ones that spin like this, rotors, because you know that's what everybody calls them, right? Um, actually, all valves for trombone are rotors. They are all something that rotates inside a casing. That's, I mean, it's, I don't even know if it needs to be inside a casing to be called a rotor. But these are all rotors. Um, this is a axial flow rotor, but we, we want to call it an axial flow valve just to avoid any confusion. So, if you look here, and hopefully you guys can see this, this rotates 90 degrees differently than a uh, rotor does, the rotor we were just talking about. Rotors um, rotate like this, and if we rotate this 90 degrees this way, these rotate like this. So if you think about the way the um, tubes go here, instead of going like this and doing this thing, um, the air on these valves goes like this, and we end up with this kind of like parallel tubes going at the same time. That's where we get axial flow. There's two tubes in the same axis that the air is going through. That's why we're called axial flow. And you can see here, um, the middle tube, this is with the valve open. You can see all the way through it right now. Um, this is with the valve not engaged, obviously, so this is the straight path. It's coming through, and then if you engage the valve, it goes like this. Now it's going through the valve tubing, goes out this way, and comes back this way, and then comes back through this middle hole. So there's actually only one, no, two ports. Yes, two ports. I'm blowing my mind here. This is kind of the same as the rotor where there's only two ports. You know, there's only the two different directions for the air to go. The same thing for this. It feels like there should be like more extra little like paths and stuff through this valve. There's really not. You get to use one of them twice, just the same as the rotor. Um, and it moves this way, obviously. The other end of the casing looks like this, where we have the path straight through the back, like that. Um, that's pretty nice and open, right? 
And then we have the engaged path right here that goes through the rest of the tubing, comes back, um, comes back through this tube, and then comes out the open one. So the air is always going through this giant open thing in the back. And that's pretty simple, right? So let's talk about the bearings. The bearing surfaces on this kind of there, I'm not sure if this goes for all kinds, are this little ring on the end of this that goes down maybe, I don't know, eighth of an inch or something like that. Pretty small amount. There's kind of like a shinier spot on the end of the valve. That's the bearing surface on that end, as well as around this port, also bearing surface. And then if I pop this up, um, this entire surface in the back, we can get that on the camera, I swear. There we go. That entire surface in the back is also a bearing surface. So there's a different amount, a different area on this valve that is a bearing surface than a rotor, but it's probably not any less than it would be on a rotor. I'm gonna oil this because, hey, I have it out. Put this back in after oil this. And you can see on this, there's a ring. Maybe you can't see it. There's a ring in the back, and that's where the bearing surface lies. So put that back in, seal it this way. So it's really important that those bearings are all oiled. Um, you can oil this one pretty easily by putting oil down um, like this open tube right here. Um, but you can't oil this one quite as easily. You can put oil down the tuning slide instead. Um, the tuning slide leg, which is actually this. And this definitely needs to be oiled. And uh, there's also this bearing surface right here where the spindle comes out, and this needs to be oiled as well. Well, Edward sells different oil for the spindle that's a little heavier. So there we go. That's how the Thayer valve operates. You could have seen that in my Thayer valve video probably, but this is a little more in-depth with the history and stuff. There we go. Thayer valve. So now we've seen how the Thayer valve works, how it looks when it's taken apart. You guys already knew that anyway, because you're super smart and you've already watched my previous videos. Um, now we know what axial flow means. We've got two tubes that are kind of going the same axis, and that's where we get the name from, axial flow. Um, let's talk about the pros and cons, starting with pros. Axial valves, Thayer's are very even. When you play through the open horn, and when you play through the not open horn, it kind of feels the same. There's more tubing added, of course, it's not exactly the same. But you don't have to change a lot about your playing to compensate for what the valve is doing. And that's kind of the main reason they are one of the valves of choice for the modern bass trombone. Uh, when you play in the low range, down to low B, down to pedal B, those notes don't feel like a different zone, a different thing you have to do with your face or with your air. They just feel kind of like home. And that's why I have them on my main bass. And a lot of that is just because they're much more open, right? The bore stays the same through the entire valve. There's never a change in the size of this tubing. And you saw that when, you, when we took it apart. It's super open. It's exactly the 594, the size the valve should be, all the way through the valve section. And that's, of course, especially important when we consider two valve setups, um, when you need to have that, that openness um, through two valves. Um, for me, they're more natural to play. It just feels more like I'm playing a trombone instead of a bass trombone. Um, I don't have to like change all these things with my air, my face, or with my sound concept to match this instrument and making it do what I want. Um, this kind of does what I want it to instead. It's kind of the other way around. Um, and oddly enough, uh, Thayer's from OE Thayer are pretty cheap. You can get an entire valve set and all the tubing that you need to make the valve wraps for $1,200, which is, it sounds like a lot, and it's not like it's chump change, but that's pretty cheap for an entire valve set that you can have someone put on for you know a few hundred more bucks, and then you end up with a two-valve Thayer instrument for maybe, at the most, like $2,000 more than you got the instrument for, which is not that much um, when you consider other valves like Rotax and stuff that are very, very expensive. Um, let's move on to the cons. Not a lot of pros in my list, um, but we'll see how they weigh out at the end. So cons. Price. They can also be really expensive. Um, Shire's axles are really expensive. That valve section is very expensive. Um, the new Ol Olsen valves are not too expensive, but I think they're a little more than the OE Thayer valves. 
Um, and it, of course, they're just not cheap in general. This instrument would probably cost a pretty penny if I just bought it new like this or had someone put it on. Um, you do have to use what some people say is more air. Um, for me, it just feels more like natural air. I'm just kind of letting the air fall out. I don't have to change anything. And I'm kind of used to using a lot of air, and I'm much more efficient now with using my air than I used to be. And I think that's in large part due to this, letting me just feel more natural. So that's a con for some people, not so much for me. Um, their valves are long. They take up a lot of room on the instrument. And so when you have two in a row like this, you lose the entire gooseneck or the part after the valve or on a straight instrument, that entire tube that goes back to the tuning slide um, right here. Um, and Thayer's are really long, so you lose all of that tapered tube. And some people think, some people think that um, that's where you lose a lot of the sound in the trombone. And so some people like a dependent Thayer system where the first valve is here and the second valve is dependent on the F valve. So you have a pretty long gooseneck all the way back to the tuning slide that way. Um, and those uh, apparently play really, really well, and that's great. Um, I never played one, and I do like the independent system. There are probably drawbacks to how I have it like, it, like, like this. They're much harder to work with, uh, both maintenance-wise. I have to take these apart and oil them every couple weeks, um, clean them and oil them. And they're really hard to make, too. Obviously, this cone shape is not as easy to machine as just a cylinder with two bores out of it. Um, and especially these, these are stainless steel casings with a stainless steel valve. Stainless steel is super hard to machine um, and shape exactly how you want it, especially with these really tight tolerances that you need for a valve that's going to seal against another part of a uh, brass instrument. So uh, they're really hard to work with both in maintenance and to manufacture, and that's one reason they're expensive. Um, it moved. Why did it move? There we go. Um, throw is part of it. Um, rotor valves only move 90 degrees, that's kind of how they're made, and Thayer's like this move a lot farther. I think it's like 60 degrees, it's definitely more than 90, it's more like this, it's probably 60 degrees. And uh, uh, no, 60 is less, 120, there we go, the one higher than 90. Um, and so some, some people kind of don't like that, the valve has to move a lot to get to the next position. I don't mind it so much because my setup is actually pretty good and the throw of these valves is pretty short. I, I don't know. I don't mind it that much. Um, some valves like uh, some Hagmans and stuff are, do feel a lot faster but that just doesn't bother me that much. Um, a different axis means different disassembly. So obviously these are built in this axis instead of this axis. A um, rotor valve would be like this and these are 90 degrees different in this plane. So when you take them apart, they have to come apart this way. And you've seen that when I take the valves apart, the entire instrument is in pieces. It's not like a, my 50B2 where I just take the valve cap off and the valve comes out. Nothing else comes apart. On this, the entire instrument has to be built around this fact that they come apart this way. And you can see that on um, any kind of Thayer setup, there's all these things that make it so you can take the bell off, so you can take the, the valve apart, so you can clean it and oil and stuff. And that is a pretty big downside. That really is kind of annoying when I have to, to work with them. They're fragile. Um, I have this on here for every valve. Every valve is fragile. Uh, these are probably a little less fragile than the average valve because they're stainless steel. But that is always something you have to think about. They're heavy. There's a lot of mass involved with a valve this large, and especially mine that, have, that are made out of stainless steel. They're not solid stainless steel. Um, the cores aren't, I don't think. I really hope they're not. Um, but they just weigh a lot, and this horn is probably heavier than most other bass trombones out there, just because of the valves. Nothing else included. There are horn, there are thayers that are not as heavy. The half cores, the aluminum cores, the uh, graphite cores, I think they made at some point. Um, those are all pretty light comparatively, but they're still heavier than a rotor, I think. Um, and that's just, just one of the downsides. I just deal with it. I kind of like it. It makes the horn sound and play differently. I kind of like how that changes how the horn plays. And again, there's different types. Let's go over some of those. We've got original. These are, are considered original because they're the original stainless steel manufactured ones. But then O.E. Thayer himself made several different kinds of his own valves. There's the aluminum cores. There's Edwards, graphite cores, Shires, Olsen, Jupiter makes their own now. And of course, there's a bunch of like Chinese knockoffs and stuff of all these kinds of valves. Um, and all of them play differently, all of them look different, all of them 
have kind of the same principle. Obviously, the axial flow, but they all play a little differently. Yamaha makes their own YSL 882V that has their own axial valve, which looks like just a cylinder on the gooseneck. Um, it actually plays really well. They're just super hard to work with, I think. Um, and it's, it's still an axial flow, quote unquote, but it's a very different way of getting about it. So there's tons of different types. Um, yeah, we'll leave it there. That's okay, we can cut it there. So wrapping up Thayer's, let's go over my opinions on the Thayer or axial flow valve. First thing I've written here is they're amazing valves. If they're set up right, and the player is up to the task. It's really important that you realize kind of what it takes to play a Thayer valve. It's not, it's not really like any other valve on the market. And I'm, it sounds like hyperbole with me saying this like, oh, come on, it's just a valve on a trombone, just play the trombone. Yes, that's true to an extent, but the way you have to approach it is just a little bit different than any other valve on the market today, I feel like. You kind of have to play in, I don't want to say like a modern way, but it's just a different different approach to what you think the sound is going to be and how it's going to blow and stuff like that. My first few times playing theirs, I actually didn't like them at all because I thought they were stuffy and they were too big and heavy and all this kind of other stuff. And then I kind of developed as a player. I started using my ear more efficiently. I started using it better, um, just a larger air calm. And ta-da, theirs started working really well for me because I got to that point as a player. And so I like theirs, and that doesn't necessarily go for everybody. Um, these are my favorite, I would say, not 100% of the time, but almost all the time for bass trombone. Um, just because I think they work really, really well on bass trombone. I think that goes for kind of all axial valves. Um, I really like Shire's axials. Edwards, eh, they're okay. The Olsen axials, when they're set up really well, are really good. That's probably what I'm going to get next after these valves. Um, and I think they're just they're great valves. And that's kind of it. Um, on tenor, I don't necessarily need an axial valve up there. I like them on tenor. I just a, a good rotor is totally fine with me because I play tenor just a little bit differently than I do bass. Uh, the 42T I just had was a little bit hard for me to get used to because it actually required me to change so much less about how I play when I put the valve down. Um, I can just be more even across the range. I can play everything the same way instead of having to change my approach in the lower register like I do right now with my 42BG. Um, I think there's a good upgrade for most horns, especially box, when they come with a standard rotary valve. This is a good direction to go if you want to upgrade. Um, they have a lot of cons. Um, not cons of two ends, but cons of one end. Like I, I listed out, there's a ton of cons with the Thayer valve, but I feel like the pros outweigh them, and they play well enough, and they move well enough for me to just kind of use them full time. Obviously, because this is what I play. <clears throat> My last thing on here is low C, man. There's nothing like playing low C on this instrument. I'll play my 50B2, and I'll be like, man, this is really good. What a good feeling low C. And then I'll pick up this and go, oh, yeah, that's why I have theirs. So that wraps up my opinions. Um, and here I'll play a little excerpt on this instrument for you guys. Let you guys hear what the Theradoff sound like. And we're back with our Hagmans now to see how they work. First, let's go over the history. So the Hagman valve was developed by Rene Hagman of Switzerland in response to the Thayer valve. The Thayer valve had come out a few years before and was pretty much recognized as a huge improvement on like a standard Bach rotor, but was also really complex and kind of difficult to work with and required a lot of maintenance to keep going. So. Rene Hagman was like, why not take this kind of idea of a more open valve that's kind of easier to work with 
So you kind of combine ease of rotors with ease of playing of Thayer's and we get this Hagman valve. And it kind of shows the huge impact that Thayer had on the trombone world. That someone actually developed a valve in response to his valve. And it's true, kind of for every valve that came after the Thayer. So let's take this apart and see how one of these valves works. So Hagman's a little odd. And these back plates, or valve caps, I guess, whatever you want to call them, do not screw on and off. They pop on and off. Ta-da! It's off. Um, you can see there's a rubber O-ring around the outside of this casing. So we got that off. Let's take off the stop arm, which is this guy on the top. And we're actually not going to take it off, we're just going to have it loose. So I, un I loosen this little Allen right here. Just a little, there we go. The Allen is now loose. And with any luck... Oh yeah, there we go. I had to think about that for a second. And get the valve out. Let's keep this in the same place. We don't have to worry about it. There we go. Ta-da! And this is a Hagman valve. There we go. That's the core. That's what it looks like. Um, so big difference that we noticed with the Hagman as compared to a rotor or a Thayer, at least a modern one, is that the valve, instead of being machined, even though part of this is machined, um, the valve is built instead of just machined. You see these tubes going through the valve. Um, these are actual tubes that have been made, rolled out, shaped to this, and then put inside the valve. Instead of taking a solid piece of brass or steel or whatever and just machining the outside and then machining something through it, which is what we do with most rotors and most Thayer's. So that's a big, big, big difference in the um, Hagman valve. You can see how the casing, or the, it's not the casing, the, ins the, the core of the valve here is made of not thin brass, but not very thick brass. This isn't just a giant hunk. And the valve tubing here is very, very thin. I actually don't want to touch it because you can just press this in with your finger. Um, it's very fragile. But this makes the, um, the core very, very light. Um, this probably weighs about as much as the, probably less than the 42B core, which is much smaller and obviously not as good as a valve. Um, this, um, this valve stem here is stainless steel. There we go. Wow, couldn't think of the material this is made out of. This is just steel, so that's a nice, um, good material that you want um, that won't like destroy everything else around it and will last forever. So let's go over the operation here. If I hold the valve like this, um, the air is coming in like so. And actually, let's hold uh, like this. There we go. There it goes in like so. It hits this opening right here. This opening is this. This goes straight through the valve. It doesn't go straight. It has like a little bend under. And you can see that right here. This is going under the other tubes inside. If it goes through this, it goes under, and then it goes through, and then it goes through the other valve, and it goes through the rest of the instrument. Ta-da! That's the open side of the valve. And then if we switch this 90 degrees... It is 90, right? Yeah, it is. I was right. If I switch this 90 degrees, ta-da, we're looking at this. You know what? It's not 90 degrees. My mind is blown. Okay, I was wrong about that. Um, I have not had a lot of experience with these. So it's less than 90 degrees. This is the open side. This is the engaged side. And this, I'm trying to put this in uh, relation to the camera, like right in the middle of this empty spot is 90 degrees. So this is less. It's maybe like 60. That gives you a little bit less throw, right? Um, if you put it like this, and let's say the horn is like so, it goes like this, it hits this. Um, this tube is one that you can see in the background here. Um, this tube goes up and goes through this, and that's our tubing right here. This goes up, it goes over, it comes back, it hits the return side right here. You can see through that, and then it goes through the rest of the instrument. So. We have pretty gentle bends that are very open and are made out of really high quality tubing, not just bored out brass or whatever. Um, and that's why Hagmans play and sound like they do. They sound and play very well. And that's how the Hagman works. Let's put it back together. Um, you can see the casing here. 
It's very thin, it's very open, um, and very kind of prone to damage. It's one of the downsides to the Hagman design. Uh, let's oil it, put it back in. This is not my instrument. I probably just destroyed that core by putting the lever on it. No, I'm just kidding. It's fine. Let's put oil on here. Let's talk about the bearings real fast. The entire top of the valve that you can see here is kind of like the back plate on the Thayer. Um, all of that needs to touch the top, and it all needs to be oiled. And you can oil that ish by putting valve oil down the top of the valve. And then all of these sides of the valve also need to be oiled because they need to seal against the rest. Let's see if I can do this without destroying anything. Oil the valve a little bit. And of course, the spindle, the um, stainless part that I couldn't remember the name of, uh, that needs to also be out. Let's, let's get this in. Um, and I don't know if you can see, there's a little tiny stainless steel nub right here. Um, that is that part I was looking for. That's how you get the valve out so you can work on it. And I want this to be right here. Um, this is another small downside to the Hagman is you have to adjust a lot of little things to make it work just right. And of course my Allen driver here is a little large. Let's make sure this is still straight. does not want to fit in these spaces. There we go. Is that on? That is on. Let's tighten that just a little more. This is stainless steel, so I'm not crunching down on any brass. Um, there we go. Get me out of the shot. And snap on that valve cap. And ta-da! We have a working oiled Hagman, and I have very oily hands. So there we go. That's how the Hagman valve works. So now we've seen how the Hagman operates. It's kind of cool. It moves in a direction 90 degrees different than the rotor again. We keep moving in 90 degree ways, but in slightly different ways. Let's talk about the pros and cons. Pros. It's an even blow. Much more even than rotors. Um, even the really, really good ones, I think. The Hagman is a little more even than that. And by even, I mean when you put the valve down, do you have to change how you play? Does the sound change? out the other end of the instrument. Does it sound like you're using a valve? And Hagman's, I think, are in a cool place that is close to Thayer's and close-ish to rotors, but in between. It's, uh, it's not all the way over on Thayer's where there's like no difference at all and it all kind of feels the same. And it's not like rotors where there's kind of a big difference, even with the really good valves. Um, that's not necessarily a bad thing. I think it's kind of more middle ground, which is a good thing for a lot of things, I guess. Um, they're easy to play. They require air, like any instrument does, but they don't require the same kind of weird thing I was talking about with theirs, where you kind of have to like change how you play maybe a little bit. Um, they don't require the same thing as rotors, where you have to change how you play a little bit just in the other direction. Um, they're just kind of like a standard, nice, open valve to play. Um, again, we have a nice short throw. Um, I think it's 60 degrees. So we have 60, 90, and 120 are the numbers I'm thinking. 60 here, 90 on rotors, and 120 on theirs. There's my Thayer ones right there. You can't see it. Um, and so this has the shortest throw of all these, um, all these valves. I don't know if it's 60. It might be a little bit more, but it's not 90. So this is, this is pretty good. Um, it's a nice short throw. That's good for so many reasons. They're light. Um, there's not a lot to the valve, as we saw, they're hollow. There's not a lot going on inside of the Hagman. Um, they're light casing, pretty thin. The actual valve itself is very thin and lightly built. Um, so, and I, I said this in my video about this instrument, I think it might be lighter than my 52 or 50B2, um, just because the valves are so light. Yeah, it has open wrap and all this other stuff, but it just feels a little bit lighter and it's very well balanced. So Hagmans are nice and light and I think that's a really good thing. Um, they're shorter on the gooseneck than Thayer's are so they don't take as much room up on the 
instrument, um, and that's always a good thing. Of course, on this, I talked about this in the 50 or 50A3 video, but this gooseneck should actually be an inch shorter, so everything can go that way. So right now you see a lot of gooseneck, but that gooseneck shouldn't be there, and that's kind of a problem. Um, and they do have easier maintenance than fares, but I don't know. Um, cons. The maintenance is not super easy to deal with. I kind of like fares because you just take them apart, you clean them, you put them back together. There's not a lot of things to adjust if they're set up right. Um, you can't really adjust it yourself. It's just there. It's done. With these, um, the stop arm on the top can be put in different places and the whole valve can kind of move in the casing a little bit. So you have to get that just right every time you take it apart and put it back together. Um, that's kind of a downside for me. Um, and I haven't figured out exactly how to do it. Uh, these are just okay, because I did it myself, um, but I feel like it could be a little bit better, and I just don't really know how to do it, so maybe that's just me. Um, they're highly prone to damage, I think much more so than Thayer's or Rotor's, just because they are very lightly built, and they're still an integral um, structural part of the trombone. They're still holding all of this stuff together with just the valves. Um, and that's kind of dangerous. If you do the same kind of thing, I was talking about the rotors where you do like a snap, uh, it's much more likely that you're gonna just push in the casing right here and render the valve useless forever. And you have to get a new one. And they cost a lot of money. That's my next con actually, right? Yes, it is. Um, Hagman's are really, really expensive. You, I mean, it's really expensive to just buy a set and then to have them put on, it's even more money. I mean, we're talking like $3,000 for like a base set. Um, and that's why I don't think you see them very often for aftermarket. Uh, you do. It's not like you never see them. But they're just so expensive to have them put on. I thought about having Havens put on one of my instruments in the past, and I got prices, and I was like, no way, man. I know they're good, but they're not that good. So I think that's a con. The price is just so high. So now we're at the end of Hagman's. Let's talk about my opinions. Um, let's see, let's get there, let's get to the right spot on my script. I think they're very, very good valves. I like them a lot. They have lots of cons, they have lots of pros, and I think they kind of balance each other out, and I think they're just really good valves. Uh, they're a great option on bass or tenor of all kinds. I really, really like the 42A, which is the Bach 42 of the Hagman valve. I think that's probably the best stock Bach 42, I'm not really sure. Um, I've played a couple 42 AFs that are really good too. Um, and I don't think those have any pitch issues like the basses do. And I just, I really like them on tenors. They're just, they're good, they're good valves. And on bass, I like them a lot too. They are less open than my Thayer's. I do miss having just like that low C that destroys worlds. Uh, I have a friend who has a 50 with um, uh, Hagman's and all this cool stuff on it. That's a really good instrument, but just like not exactly what I would want a bass. So. Probably not my first choice on bass trombone. Um, I think the 40, or 50A3 and the 42A are the best stock box. I kind of said that about the 42. Um, if you get one of these that's fixed and not flat, I think it's the best one you can just buy straight from the factory. And I've said that before. Um, there's a reason that the Hagman is a stock valve on so many instruments that come from Europe. Tyne, bass trombones, um, Shagirl makes all their trombones with uh, Hagman's. Wrath makes most of their trombones with Hagman's. There's so many European makers that just come with these stock because they're such good valves. Um, I think they probably get them cheaper than you can buy them here, maybe, I'm not sure. Um, for, I mean, like I just said, the, the only reason I wouldn't choose them here is because they're just too expensive. And that all comes down to the fact that there's only one kind, there's only one maker of Hagman's and that's Hagman. They make their own valves, nobody else makes them. There's no, um, you know, building them by license or anything. And so they can kind of charge whatever they want and that ends up being too much for me. So that's just, you know, that's kind of a downside. It should be in the con list. Uh, they just cost a lot and that's just kind of how it is. So now let's listen to me play something on this, um, about 25 cents flat. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
So, last things last, the conclusion. Um, sorry I didn't have all kinds of valves here. I only had three basic types, um, but you know I don't have that many instruments, and most of them have the same kind of rotor valves on them. I don't have Shire's true bores anymore, so I don't, I don't have any of those um, with me. That's okay. They're kind of like Hagman's, but set up like a rotor, it's like Hagman on its side. And it's not exactly the same. They're milled out. Um, it's a different uh, construction, but kind of the same ideal. And they have a straight tube through the open side, so that's why they're larger. Um, and I'm missing, you know, like I said at the beginning, some of the cool fancy valves that aren't used anymore, millers and stuff like that. Uh, let's see. So any valve can be acceptable, especially if the instrument is designed around it and the valve is in good shape. My example I want to give is the old S22 George Roberts trombone, bass trombone. It's a single valve bass trombone with a nine inch bell and it has a rotor valve much smaller than the Bach valves on this instrument. And is it stuffy? I wouldn't really call it stuffy. It's not open. Uh, but it plays really, really, really well, and you sound like George Roberts when you play it. That's a good design, designed around a really small valve that works great. And the entire instrument has to be considered. The valve does not make the instrument. The valve might make the instrument better, might make it worse, but it's not going to completely ruin or make something just amazing. Um, I think it will get a lot of the way there, especially when you consider bass trombones, but it's not 100% of the argument, I guess. And you really need to ask yourself what you want your valve to do. Do you play tenor and you don't spend a whole lot of time in the valve range? Then almost anything is probably going to work for you, and you're really working around how the valve plays when you're not using it. Um, each valve does play differently when you play through the open side. Um, for instance, these, yes, these are the smallest, but you have a ton of gooseneck. You have all of this tapered tuning or tubing um, that makes the instrument probably play better through the open side than these do in a lot of ways. Um, and this plays differently because you're playing through two giant old valves and a straight tube and a giant old valve and another straight tube. And I like how it plays open, but it's definitely different than this does. So when you play tenor trombone and you're playing high most of the time or whatever, the valve will make a difference, but not so much when you're playing it it's when you're not playing it. And you really just need to ask yourself what you need your valves to do. On bass, um, if I played mostly jazz stuff, I probably would not use this. Just because it is heavy, it doesn't have quite the same sound. Valves are just a little slower than maybe even these. Um, many valves are just really good upgrades. I already talked about Hangman's, these guys. Um, I could put a lot of different valves on my 50B2 and it would be a good choice, I think. So. I don't think there's a lot of bad choices out there. They just need to be in good shape and set up really well by good tech. Obviously, I upgraded my 42B that's not here to a 42BO with an Olsen rotary valve. Um, I think that's a really good option. It's still a rotor valve. It's maybe not a Thayer, but it's just a really good option for me, and it was pretty cheap. That's the main reason I did it. Uh, <clears throat> price and maintenance should not be overlooked. Um, valves that are cheap might not be as good, but sometimes that that price point does make a difference. I would love to have Hagman's on all my 42s, but I'm not willing to spend $2,000 to have one Hagman put on my 42. That's just not worth it for me. So I bought a $100 valve that's going to be maybe even better what it, than a Hagman would be on my 42. And that's something you can't really overlook. Maintenance is the same thing. If you don't want to spend 30 minutes every two weeks taking your valves apart and oiling them and cleaning them and putting it back together, then Thayer's Hagman's are probably not for you and you should probably stick with rotors. Um, I've definitely played a lot of horns with rotors that have definitely not been oiled or cleaned in probably 20 or 30 years. Um, this one is in really good shape, but the other 50B2s I've had, um, I took the valves out and went, yep, no one has ever taken this apart before. And I see that a lot in a lot of instruments. I think these stayers are the same way actually. Um, and yeah, the instrument's going to work, but it's not going to work very well. Um, a little small point about Chinese copies. So there's lots of horns made by Jinbao and the other companies in China uh, that have stayers, they have Hagman's quote unquote, these are not the actual things. They have all sorts of different kinds of rotors. These 
can be good, possibly, if they make them really well, but most of the time they're probably not because they're not made with the same um, tools, not the same materials, not the same, perhaps, care, um, definitely not the same workers than Hagen uses or the different Thayer companies use or even the rotor companies use to make their horns. So just buyer beware some of those horns with Hagmans and stuff. And they can be good, but usually they're probably not. So I would stick to something that's rotors because these are easy to make, kind of hard to get wrong. Um, and my last two points, maintain your stupid valves. Oil them, take them apart, clean them out, put them back together, all carefully of course, and just keep doing that because it'll make a huge difference. Any instrument will play so much better with an oiled valve. I do this all the time with my, my section mates back in college. I'd take their horns home, clean them out, put them get back together with oil and everything, and they would go, wow, it's a different instrument. And I'm like, yeah, because now your valve seals and you're not wasting half of your air out of your valve casing. Um, this came with giant leaks in the valves and like almost didn't work at all. It worked, but it did not work very well. And after getting it worked on and after maintaining them really well, they're great valves. Um, and last point of course is, of course, is uh, practice. You know, if you get better at your instrument, uh, the valves will be easier to play no matter what they are. Hope you guys have enjoyed. It's been a long, arduous process for me. And uh, see you guys next time.